let this symbol represent 100,000 deaths. This is what a million deaths look like. This is how many people were killed by Adolf Hitler. This is how many people were killed by Joseph Stalin. And this is how many died on the account of Chinese Communist leader Mao Zedong. That's twice the combined death tally of Hitler and Stalin put together. It's one hair-raising analogy, wouldn't you agree? I'm not afraid of nuclear war. There are 2.7 billion people in the world. It doesn't matter if some are killed. China has a population of 600 million. Even if half of them are killed, there are still 300 million people left. Re-listen to the previous line and try, just try to wrap your head around the psychology of the person capable of such a thought. Heavily disturbing, isn't it? Well, this is Mao Zedong in one of his speeches in 1957. What comes to your mind when you hear the word tyrant? The Oxford Dictionary defines it as a person who has complete power in a country and uses it in a cruel and unfair way. Let me ask you another question. Who, according to you, is the biggest tyrant in history, or let's say modern history. Some of you might suggest the biggest villain among the villains, the famous Nazi leader Adolf Hitler. Or a few may be inclined towards the Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin, both of whom are responsible for tens of millions of deaths. But as we mentioned earlier, and also according to historians, Mao Zedong outdid everyone when it comes to being the world's biggest mass murderer in the history of tyrants. Welcome to Basics Daily, and today, from the depths of history, we are here with another video on the man, the myth, and the murderer, Mao Zedong. Whether you're a seasoned enthusiast or a newbie eager beaver, join us as we unravel knowledge, delve into untold stories, and shed light on the life of one of the most historic figures of the 20th century. But before all that, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Mao was born on December 26, 1893 in the village of Shaoshan, which lies in the Hunan province, China. His father, Mao Yicheng, was a prosperous farmer and grain dealer, while his mother, Wen Shimei, was a devout Buddhist. Growing up in the rural Hunan, Mao described his father as a stern disciplinarian who would beat him and his three siblings, the boys Zhimen and Zetan, as well as an adopted girl, Zhizheng. Unlike his father, Mao's relationship with his mother was endearingly harmonious. Emulating her, Mao too became a Buddhist, although he later forsook it in his later adolescence. At the age of eight, Mao began attending the Shaoshan Primary School, where he studied the Chinese value systems of Confucianism. However, at 13, due to his rebellious attitude and his father's deteriorating financial situation, his formal education was interrupted and he was forced to work full-time on his family's farm. Despite the challenges, Mao's thirst for knowledge remained strong. He developed a deep interest in Chinese history, politics, and philosophy, immersing himself in the works of Confucius, Mencius, and other influential thinkers of the time. They say childhood, in essence, is the foundation for later acts of life, and Mao was no exception to this observation. Be it his attitude towards an authoritative father or teachers in school, or his hatred towards traditional customs like filial piety and arranged marriage, rebellion ran in Mao's blood from early on. In 1907, Mao's father arranged a marriage for his 14-year-old son to a 17-year-old Luo Yixiao, uniting their landowning families. True to his rebellious streak, Mao refused to acknowledge her as his wife and temporarily moved away from his house. Luo was locally disgraced and died in 1910. Back to working his father's farm, Mao read voraciously and developed a political consciousness from Chang Guanying's booklet which lamented the deterioration of Chinese power and argued for the adoption of representative democracy. Mao was also inspired by the military prowess and nationalistic fervor of George Washington and Napoleon Bonaparte. In 1911, when he was 17, Mao moved to Changsha, the capital of Hunan province, to pursue higher education. 
There he came in contact with new ideas from the West, as formulated by political and cultural reformers such as Lian Chi Chao and the nationalist revolutionary Sun Yat-sen. Scarcely had he begun studying revolutionary ideas when a real revolution took place before his very eyes. On October 10, 1911, fighting against the Imperial Qing Dynasty broke out in Wu Qin, and within two weeks the Xin Ye Revolution had spread to Changsha. Enlisting in a unit of the Revolutionary Army in Hunan, Mao spent six months as a soldier. Though he saw no actual combat, still, his first brief military experience at least confirmed his boyhood admiration of military leaders and their exploits. The spring of 1912 marked the birth of the new Chinese Republic, abolishing the long-standing monarchy in China and also the end of Mao's military service. Over the next few years, Mao enrolled and dropped out of a police academy, a soap production school, a law school, an economics school, and the government-run Changsha Middle School. Studying independently, he spent much time in Changsha's library, reading core works of classical liberalism as well as the works of Western scientists and philosophers, viewing himself as an intellectual. Following his desire to become a teacher, Mao enrolled at the Fourth Normal School of Changsha, which soon merged with the first normal school of Hunan, widely seen as the best in Hunan. There, a professor named Yang Chonggi befriended Mao and urged him to read a radical newspaper, Xin Qing Yin, which means New Youth. While at the school, Mao also acquired his first experience in political activity by helping to establish several student organizations. The most important of those was the New People's Study Society, founded in the winter of 1917 through 18, many of whose members were later to join the Communist Party. It was also during this time Mao came into contact with representatives of the Socialist Youth League who introduced him to the writings of Karl Marx and Vladimir Lenin. And this is where the fire was lit. His encounter with Marxist literature and learning of the recent Russian Revolution had a profound impact on his political worldview, leading him to embrace the ideology of communism as the answer to uniting China and bringing it out of the grip of war and exploitation. Mao eventually graduated from the first provincial normal school in Changsha in 1918, and instead of becoming a teacher, followed his professor Yang to Peking University in Beijing, China's leading intellectual center. The six months he spent there working as a librarian's assistant acted as a catalyst in shaping his future career, for it was then that he came under the influence of the two men who were to be the principal figures in the foundation of the CCP, Li Da Zhao and Qin Do Shou. In the meantime, Mao married again in 1922 Yang Qihui, the daughter of one of his mentors. The Chinese Communist Party was founded by Qin Do Shou and Li Da Zhao in 1921 with Mao at the very heart of the movement as one of its founding members. There was still a ruling nationalist party in China that Mao had supported from the beginning. And in 1923, when the Young Communist Party allied with Sun Yat-sen's Nationalist Party, or Kuomintang, Mao was one of the first communists to join the Nationalist Party and work within it. But six years later, the Kuomintang, or KMT, under Chiang Kai-shek, had a major fallout. Chiang turned on the communists, who by now numbered in the tens of thousands across China. Chang ignored the orders of the Wuhan-based left KMT government and marched on Shanghai, a city controlled by communist militias. As the communists awaited Chang's arrival, he massacred 5,000 with the aid of the Green Gang. In Beijing, 19 leading communists were killed by Chang Zuolin. That May, tens of thousands of communists and those suspected of being communists were killed and the CCP lost approximately 15,000 of its 25,000 members. This was the start of the first Chinese Civil War. To stop Chiang, the CCP founded the Workers and Peasants Red Army of China, better known as the Red Army with Mao as its commander-in-chief. 
That fall, Mao led the Autumn Harvest Uprising in Changsha against the Kuomintang, or KMT. The KMT crushed Mao's peasant army, better known as the Red Army, killing 90% of them and forcing the survivors out into the countryside where they rallied more peasants to their cause. Subsequently, in June 1928, the KMT took Beijing and was recognized as the official government of China by foreign powers. However, Mao continued the good old fight and was able to set up peasant Soviets in the southern Hunan and Yangshi provinces. The efforts paid off, and in 1934, he formed the Soviet Republic of China, with 10 provinces of the country under his communist control. When a local warlord beheaded Mao's second wife in front of her eight-year-old son upon her refusal to denounce communism, Mao ordered a reign of terror against landlords. Perhaps more than 200,000 were tortured and killed. In response, Chiang Kai-shek's troops surrounded the Red Army in the mountains of Yangshi, forcing them to make a desperate escape in 1934. Despite the dire situation, Mao was able to rally the troops, better known as the Long March. This move cemented Mao's position as a leader of the Chinese communists. Things took a drastic turn when Imperial Japan invaded China in 1937, forcing the communists and KMT to unite again for the foreseeable future. Together with the Allied forces, they were able to defeat Japan. But the seeds of enmity were too deeply rooted, thus ensuring a second civil war. The turning point was the 1948 Siege of Chengchun, in which the Red Army, now called the People's Liberation Army, or PLA, under the direct order of Mao, starved and killed an estimated 160 thousand people. In the aftermath that followed, the PLA was successful in overthrowing the KMT with the remainder of the KMT fleeing to Taiwan. Mao wanted the whole of China and he finally got it. On October 1st, 1949, Mao proclaimed the foundation of the People's Republic of China, a one-party socialist state controlled by the Communist Party. In the following years, Mao solidified his control through land reforms and other campaigns against landlords, people he termed counter-revolutionaries and other perceived enemies of the state. During the land reform campaigns, large numbers of landlords and rich peasants were beaten to death at mass meetings organized by the Communist Party, and their land was granted to poor peasants. The campaign to suppress counter-revolutionaries targeted the bureaucratic bourgeoisie, such as compradors, merchants, and Kuomintang officials, who were seen by the party as economic parasites or political enemies. The land reform campaign alone saw the execution of two to five million landlords, and Mao himself claimed the killing of around 700,000 people in attacks on counter-revolutionaries during the years 1950 through 1952. In addition, at least 1.5 million people, perhaps as many as 4 to 6 million, were sent to reform through labor camps, where considerable numbers of them perished. Mao played a personal role in organizing mass repressions and established a system of execution quotas, which were often exceeded. He defended these killings as necessary for the securing of power. Political power grows out of the barrel of a gun, as said by the man himself. But in these years, Mao did some good too. Significant strides were seen in sectors such as healthcare and education. The Mao government is credited with eradicating both the consumption and production of opium during the 1950s using unrestrained repression and social reform. Women's rights were given precedence. It's said that because of Mao's policies, life expectancy improved quite quickly in the country. Economic inequality was also reduced due to his campaign, such as land reforms. But we wonder, at what cost? Mao was loved and heralded as the champion of the ruling class, but that's the thing about tyrants. All tyrants were loved at some point in their reign. Hitler was celebrated once, so was Stalin, or Gaddafi, or Saddam Hussein, for that matter, so was our Mao. 
but the worst is yet to come. After consolidating his power, Mao launched the first five-year plan, which aimed to end Chinese dependence on agriculture to become a world power. With the Soviet Union's assistance, new industrial plants were built, and agricultural production eventually fell to a point where industry was beginning to produce enough capital that China no longer needed the USSR's support. Meanwhile, Mao launched another campaign in 1956 called the Hundred Flowers Campaign, in which Mao indicated his supposed willingness to consider different opinions about how China should be governed. Given the freedom to express themselves, liberal and intellectual Chinese began opposing the Communist Party and questioning its leadership. This was initially tolerated and encouraged, but soon the executions followed, along with jail time and condemnation to prison camps. However, Mao's vision of the first five-year plan did fructify, and the first five-year plan succeeded in raising output in many areas that even exceeded the set targets. But Mao wanted more. Unhappy with the disparity in terms of progress between agriculture and industry, Mao called for a change in policy during the second five-year plan. What happened next was all hell broke loose. To turn China from an agrarian nation to an industrialized one mimicking the Soviet's model for economic growth, Mao launched the second five-year plan, or the Great Leap Forward, in January 1958. This mass mobilization of the country's huge population was to achieve, in just a few years, economic advances that took other nations many decades to accomplish. Mao, inspired by the Stalinist ideology that stressed the key role of heavy industry, made steel production the centerpiece of his deluded voyage. He argued that it was necessary for China to strike while the iron was hot and press forward with willpower and dedication. Instead of working in the fields, tens of millions of peasants were ordered to mine local deposits of iron ore and limestone, cut trees for charcoal, build simple clay furnaces and smelt metal. This fierce enterprise did not produce steel, but mostly lumps of brittle cast iron unfit for even simple tools. Peasants were forced to abandon all private food production. Newly formed agricultural communes planted less land for grain, which at that time was the source of more than 80% of China's food energy. In an effort to win favor with their superiors and avoid being purged, each layer in the party hierarchy exaggerated the amount of grain produced under them. High targets had to be matched, and, failing to do so, severe punishments were levied, with peasants getting the brunt of it. The movement from field to factory also meant lower grain production, and as food shortages continued, fabricated reports of record grain harvests were issued to demonstrate the superiority of communal farming. Based upon the fabricated success, party cadres were ordered to requisition a disproportionately high amount of the true harvest for state use primarily in the cities and urban areas. Not to mention that the government continued to export grain and other agricultural products to increase its revenue and keep up the appearance that productivity was increasing. The diversion of labor to steel production and infrastructure projects, compounded by natural disasters such as droughts and floods, led to an approximately 15% drop in grain production in 1959, followed by a further 10% decline in 60 and no recovery in 61. The result? A terrible, terrible famine. It's hard to land on the exact figure of how many people died in the Great Chinese Famine, but it's widely documented that approximately 40 million people perished, with the figure going as high as 55 million. But if you think famine is the only thing that's terrible about the Great Leap Forward, folks, you've got another thing coming. Respect for human life and compassion for human suffering have never been hallmarks of international communism, whether of the Soviets or the Chinese. The CCP hides the violence and murder during the Great Leap Forward, blaming it on poor policy and natural reasons. But that's not the half of it. Not all deaths during the Great Leap Forward were from starvation. Frank DeShutter, in his book Mao's Great Famine, 
estimates that at least 2.5 million people were beaten or tortured to death, and 1 million to 3 million committed suicide. He provided some illustrative examples and claimed that in Xinjiang, where over a million died in 1960, 6 to 7% of these were beaten to death by the militias. In Daoxin, 10% of those who died had been buried alive, clubbed to death, or otherwise killed by party members and their militia. In Ximen County, around 13,500 died in 1960. Of these, 12% were beaten or driven to their deaths. And that's not the darkest chapter at all. February 25th, 1960, Hongtai Commune, Yao Hejia Village. Yang John Shin, a poor farmer, is arrested for a recent crime. The victim is Yang Ershan. Take a look at the report. Relationship with culprit, younger brother. Manner of crime, killed and eaten. Reason, livelihood issues. The same report includes other victims of cannibalism in the same city. 12 were killed and eaten. 16 died of other causes and were eaten after. 48 bodies were exhumed and eaten. Another such case is when a boy stole a handful of grain in a Henan village and the local boss, Sheng Dei Cheng, forced his father to bury his son alive on the spot. One report dated November 30th, 1960 and circulated to the top leadership, most likely including Mao, tells how a man named Wang Ziyu had one of his ears chopped off, his legs tied up with iron wire and a 10 kilogram stone dropped on his back before he was branded with a sizzling tool. His crime? Digging up a potato. In late autumn of 1958, Mao condemned the practices that were being used during the Great Leap Forward, but still refused to abandon them. This caused Mao to lose esteem among many of the top party cadres, and he was eventually forced to abandon the policy in 1962, while losing some political power to moderate leaders most notably Liu Shaoqi and Deng Xiaoping in the process. He was able to retain the chairman of the Communist Party with the presidency transferred to Liu Shaoqi whilst he plotted his return to power. On the international front, tensions had been brewing between Mao and the Soviet premier Nikita Khrushchev ever since the latter succeeded Stalin in the mid-1950s. Mao was categorically upset by Khrushchev's denunciation of Stalin's fierce authoritarianism and more moderate stance towards the Western powers. He also found himself at odds with Moscow about the country's interpretation of communism. The Soviets also blamed the Great Leap Forward and, truthfully, he did surpass the Nazi Holocaust or the Soviet's Gulag, for that matter. At about the same time, Mao began to denounce the Chinese new bourgeois elements among the privileged strata of the state and party bureaucracy. During the next three years, Mao waged a struggle primarily through the socialist education movement in the countryside. And by the end of 1964, when Liu Shaoqi refused to accept Mao's demand, Mao decided that Liu had to go. If you think after being responsible for millions of deaths, Mao would finally stop, well, you're wrong. In 1966, Mao tried to regain the trust of the people and once again became the state chairman. He had to place the blame for his mistakes elsewhere. So he claimed that the bourgeoisie or the top 1% were ruining everything and that he was truly on the side of the peasant people. He called for the youth of the country to take back the revolution from the rightists. These young red guards would do the dirty work in Mao's cultural revolution, destroying the four olds, which were old customs, old culture, old habits, and old ideas. His interpretation of communism was so different from the rest of the world. Many called his philosophy Maoism. Instead of isolating his people from the outside world like other communist nations, he encouraged globalization and open trade, which is why China's economy eventually rebounded, and it set the stage for the economic strength that it has today. But again we ask, at what cost? In the chaos and violence that ensued, much of China's artistic legacy was destroyed. 
millions were persecuted and millions were killed. Owing to the difficulties that scholars in and outside China encounter in accessing state secrets, the exact death toll during this phase has become a recurring debate in the field of China studies. Estimates by various scholars indicate at least a million people were killed during the so-called purification of China, with numbers going as high as 8 million. When Mao was informed of such losses, particularly that people had been driven to suicide, he is alleged to have commented, people who try to commit suicide don't attempt to save them. China is such a populous nation, it is not as if we cannot do without a few people. Mao eventually declared the Cultural Revolution to be over in 1969, although various historians inside and outside of China marked the end of the Cultural Revolution as a whole in 1976, following Mao's death and the arrest of the Maoist political faction called the Gang of Four. Throughout the 1970s, Mao's health steadily deteriorated. He may have been suffering from Parkinson's disease or ALS in addition to heart and lung trouble brought on by a lifetime of smoking. By July 1976, when the country was in crisis due to the Great Tangshin earthquake, the 82-year-old Mao was confined to a hospital bed in Beijing. He suffered two major heart attacks early in September and died September 9, 1976, after being removed from life support. Mao remains a controversial figure with little agreement over his legacy both in China and abroad. He is regarded as one of the most important and influential individuals of the 20th century. And he did some good too. Let's count them. He helped drive imperialism out of China and unify China by ending the previous decades of civil war. He encouraged education and women's rights. He laid the foundation for China to become the economic powerhouse it is today. Now let's consider the bad. His policies resulted in the deaths of tens of millions of people in China during his 27-year reign, more than any other 20th century leader, with estimates running from 40 million to as many as 80 million. Starvation, persecution, prison labor, mass executions, and cannibalism were common during his reign of terror. What exceeds what? I think we all know the answer 